with impossible objects, you know, and added to manufacturing in general has the ability with a lot of design freedoms gives you significant build freedoms to make some of these complex slash impossible parts uh, cost effectively and uh, and you can make them now. So Impossible Objects was founded in 2012 by a gentleman and founder Bob Swartz uh, in Chicago. Bob grew up in the 2D printing industry. And if you think of you know 2D printing, particularly like newspaper printing presses, on how fast materials go through a newspaper printing process in stack newspapers. Bob had the idea, it's just like, hey, wow, you know, one of the limitations for 3D printing and additive is um, speed, because most of the, the processes take um, hours or days to build a part. And then size. So with like 2D printing presses, you get the speed, and you can get various sizes. You can get small sizes, medium sizes, or large sizes. And so how do you basically take a, a very known technology and come up with a derivative of that to make a high performance, high speed, low cost composite part and hence Impossible Objects was born. Well, I think that uh, certainly 3D printing and additive manufacturing, I'm gonna use those uh, words jointly, has been around since the late 80s. Point, I think with the younger generation and the world of kind of on demand that we live in, there's kind of this expectation, whether it's food or whether it's movies or um, getting your merchandise, we're kind of living in an on demand world. Now, then you basically um, couple that with um, digital workflows. Um, so the technology, the 3D printing additive technologies answers kind of a lot of that is it gives you that digital uh, workflow it can provide um, kind of on-demand or faster response to what your product needs might be. And I think it's also going to be powered by, you know, this younger uh, workforce that's coming on. That's all they know is, is kind of um, the digital world. So I think that, you know, it's really going to be fun to see what, uh, what lies beyond on that front. I think as you look into the future, um, you know, one emerging health area of focus is healthcare. You know, where's can this technology go to improve the quality of life for human beings? Whether that be in prosthetics, orthotics, uh, things of that type that, that are more custom to a human's body. Well, you get that with uh, the 3D printing technologies can produce those types of things with a wide variety of materials. It, it's a very different additive process. We're basically taking fiber sheets and printing an image on it. And once we print the image on it, we apply a powdered, uh, what we call matrix material, could be thermal plastic or thermal set. And then we stack up all these fiber sheets. And then under heat and pressure, we form, um, press all these sheets together. Uh, and that's where you're basically forming your composite parts. And then we have a, a final step to remove um, the parts from the build block. And um, so it's, it's, I like to call it compression molding without the need for um, hard metal tooling. And so it's more of a lamination process using fiber sheets and um, high performance matrix materials to make your parts, which is very different than like uh, laser centering or stereolithography or extrusion based additive processes, which is basically the predominant ones being used worldwide right now. So there's a couple uh, different areas of use that the technology is being adopted for. The first one happens to be for tooling used in electronics manufacturing. Anything that has a printed circuit board in it will use various types of electronic tools. Typically, these tools are made with a carbon fiber peak uh, material combination um, that are typically machined. And so with the additive, with the CBAM process, we could build these tools uh, quicker and get them to the point of usage uh, much quicker. And depending on qu uh, quantities, at a lower cost compared to conventional techniques. And so um, tooling uh, for the electronics industry is one key area. Another area of uh, use happens to be for, for um, the unmanned or, or drone area, um, both for air and ground. And the reason being there that, you know, a lot of these drones run on batteries and we're replacing metal, which is, uh, and we're 60% lighter than aluminum. 
So if you have a, a, a lighter weight drone, it's going to be able to um, last longer in its mission or on its battery charge and or carry a larger um, um, payload. So that we have basically three different types of materials used to use in this process. We have fiber sheets. And so the main fiber sheets that we're working with to date is a, either a carbon fiber sheet or a fiberglass sheet. And then we deposit a special wetting ink onto it, the sheet. And so there's some uh, material science that goes into the fiber sheets, the inks, and then I, uh, and then we have these powdered, um, powdered materials that we drop on the sheets. Um, usually 50 to 70 microns in size in spherical shape, and they can be thermoplastic or thermal set. But there's a lot of material science that goes on. Uh, once the powder lands onto where you, you put your ink onto the fiber shape, the, the ink in the capillary forces will hold that, that powder particle uh, onto the fiber sheet. So there's you know, the right types of formulations to make sure you have the right adherence to the fiber sheets, that it sticks, and that you've got good flowability once you get to temperature, that the materials will then flow through the fiber sheets. So definitely the, the secret sauce is uh, the material science and the processing of those materials.